on February the 8th, a simple chapel service at Asbury University in Kentucky was supernaturally transformed into a prayer and worship service that has been exponentially burning in Holy Spirit revival fire for the last 12 straight days, 24-7. Now, I'm sure on that first Wednesday when the, the, everyone gathered for chapel, probably about a 45-minute service, they figured, you know, I'm going do a little worship here, and then I'll go back to class or go back home. But God, but God had a bigger picture in progress. And it seems like Holy Spirit is doing something, something transfigurative. And it's beginning in a small little private college in Kentucky. And people from around the world are now being tuned in to, hey, is God doing something here that we need to be called and be a part of transformationally? Hmm. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Last Sunday, you will recall that I spoke to Jesus calling his first disciples together. They were probably thinking in the moment that their mission was going to be like a chapel service where they'd gather together 45 minutes and then, you know, hear some good God things and go home. Or since last Sunday was Super Bowl Sunday, maybe they thought it was going to be like a, like a, a football game where they'd play really hard on the mission field for four straight quarters. And then of course it's over today. However, Jesus is giving three of his 12 disciples a bigger picture than just four quarters. It's a long look that goes beyond quarter one, quarter two, half time, quarter three, quarter four. And it's more than just lifting up the Lombardi trophy and saying, we are the champions. That was exhausting. Glad it's not over. Yeah, maybe next time we'll get it after it again. No. Because to follow Jesus is not a game. It is a lifestyle. It is a new, exciting, extremely difficult, frustrating, yet exciting lifestyle that you and I are called to participate in as we say we are believers in some kind of fashion. Today, as we've been mentioning, is Transfiguration Sunday, which ironically marks the end of the football season, but now leads us into the Lenten season. Are you ready for some faith ball? <laughs> because this Wednesday, Ash Wednesday, we kick off the 40 days of the Lenten season. Transfiguration Sunday, Ash Wednesday, they are teammates. They play together for a big picture plan. Not just a one and done, but a big picture plan of what the outcome of Lent is supposed to look like. Because the outcome of believing Jesus and then following Jesus is to become like Jesus. To be shaped like him. That is the ultimate outcome of the end of the Lenten season. It's literally to say, here I am, Lord. I am broken. I am busted. I am bleeding. But I surrender myself to you. Hold me in your loving arms because I trust they are loving hands. Go ahead, shape me, moldy. Yeah, it may hurt every once in a while to be twisted and formed. But I know it's for my own good because I do know that you love me. Because, friends, we are created in the image of God, just like clay. Which means we are designed and shaped above all else. Hear this? To have an ongoing relationship with our Creator. That's what it means to be created in God's image. To have an ongoing relationship with the Father. And Jesus shows us how that can be. So let's speak to that this morning. How Jesus shapes us to the patterns of His life. His death and His resurrection so that we can now know and receive and live into the same relationship Jesus has with the Father. One that has power, one that has purpose. Here's what Jesus says in John 13, 15. Friends, I've set before you an example or a pattern or I'm modeling for you that which you should do as I have done to you. So what He's saying is, do as I do. Follow me. Watch me. Let me model you. Jesus here is claiming to be a living template for the life that we were meant to live, for the life that God created you to have, sharing every aspect of the life of Jesus. The disciples went where Jesus went. They ate where he ate. They slept where he slept. They lived in the kind of relationship where they'd pause every once in a while and say, Lord, we don't understand. Help us to understand. 
They watched Jesus perform miracles, miracles, and still sometimes wrestled with what that meant. But in doing so, they began to know what Jesus knew, and they began to do and speak like Jesus would do and speak. Ultimately, so they could be shaped like Jesus as his body to be sent out exponentially, the body of Christ everywhere, all the time, 24-7. And so when we're shaped like Jesus, we begin to preach like Jesus. You may say, well, I'll never get up in front with a microphone and preach in front of people. Maybe that is not your calling, but it is your calling to be able to share the gospel with somebody else, the good news of God in your life with somebody else. It is your calling like Jesus to raise the dead. There's plenty of dead things around us all the time. Speak Jesus into it. How about Jesus healed the sick? There's a lot of different kinds of sickness, not just physical sickness. Jesus calls us as the body to speak Jesus and bring healing as well. That's so absolutely crucial friends, for our understanding of what it means to be church. Because all in all, church around the world, I don't think, and of course I'm right, <laughs> the church doesn't show people, model for people, demonstrate for people how to be a disciple of Jesus very well. We get together and we, we talk about Jesus, we study Jesus, we sing about Jesus, we even serve Jesus really well oftentimes. But are we literally saying, I'm dying to myself so that you can fill me up with you, dear Jesus. And then be the church that we're called to be everywhere, all the time. In power and in purpose. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12 and 2, Paul writes this. I love this, by the way. He says, stop. Do not, do not be conformed that is molded and shaped like clay to this world. This broken world. This world that's full of half-truths and flat-out lies about who you are and what your purpose in life is to be. But instead, he says, be transformed, moved and shaped by the renewing of your minds so that you may now discern what is the will of God. Well, what is God's will? Well, it'd be easy when we have the mind of Christ because he shaped us to have his mind, to have the relationship Jesus had with the Father. Then we will know the, the good and pleasing will of God. And so today we continue our message series on Rediscovering Luke and its good news with the story known as the Transfiguration from Luke chapter 9, 28. It begins, as we heard read, with Jesus inviting three of his 12 disciples to join him on a mountaintop experience, to go up, hear that? To go up, to go up and begin to be encountered with the living God. It will be way more than just a great academic teaching, which is what a lot of churches oftentimes do, but a literally reshaping of our faces, how we look, how we see, how we are seen, to no longer be conforming to the patterns of this broken world, but instead to look different, to be different, to speak different, to have people drawn to us because we are different than the world so that we're following the patterns of the life of Jesus. In verse 29, it says Jesus' face was transformed or, or transfigured. Another way of saying that is it was altered. His face was altered. I doubt if he was scowling. Mm. I think it was just lit up with a, a sense of joy, don't you? It says he was transfigured. Trans is moving. Figured is taking on a new figure, a new shape. Because he wants his disciples to see, at least his three, Peter, James, and John, to see the face of God. Moses, as you recall, in the Old Testament, was not allowed to see the face of God. But we are in this moment. What a blessing that is. We get to see the face of God because we get to see Jesus, his life. If you want to know what God is up to, go to the scripture. What's Jesus up to? What did Jesus say? What did Jesus do? When he laid himself out at the cross, what kind of God is that? We see the face of God when we see the face of Jesus. And Jesus is inviting us into that kind of relationship right here, right now. And it begins with prayer. That is the most intimate and ultimate relationship you can have. So much so that his, his face has changed to the face of God. I mean, when you're talking to somebody and they're full of joy, have you ever noticed your face gets full of joy too? And when you're talking to someone and they're full of sorrow, 
your face is full of sorrow too. So you take on the face of someone you're intimate with, you're talking to. So God says, I want you to take on my face. And here's what his face is. As we enter into this Lenten season, it is a face of passionate suffering. Passionate suffering. Because when you love something dearly, right, you suffer with and for that person or thing. Now, don't miss that detail today. Because Jesus is showing us that when we're connecting to the Father in a relationship, going up, up to the Father, through prayer, we are now taking on an attribute of God. And he wants us to have his attributes as the body of his Son. Here's a quick example. If you look to the screen, you'll see a picture of the cross and the heart that you found out in the front lobby last Sunday. I spoke to how Jesus was catching his disciples and they, inviting them to drop their nets and come and to follow him. And then we went on to say, who are three people in your life that you know that you love? You love them so much and you're suffering because you know they don't know Jesus. They don't have a faith or a very strong faith. And because of that, you, you hurt for them. So write down their names. Put it up on that cross. Put it up on that heart. And begin to pray for them. So they can somehow supernaturally know the love of God in their life. Now, let's watch how that connects back to Luke 9. Because as the story continues, suddenly, two great men of the Hebrew faith appear with Jesus. It is Elijah. And it is Moses, pillars of the law and the prophets. And in verse 31, they are oddly speaking of the departure of Jesus. You guys know that Elijah and Moses are from the distant past. But now in the moment, they are participating in the shaping of Jesus' mission for the future. It's like Asbury. You know, the three disciples had no idea what this prayer service was going to end up looking like. But something started, something big. Here, Moses, right? The Exodus story of Moses. He says, this is what God wants you to do. He wants you to find the perfect lamb, slaughter it, take that blood, wipe it on the doorposts. The Hebrew people who were obedient and faithful because they trusted such an odd request, did it. And when the spirit of death came over, it passed over them. The blood had saved them. The Holy Spirit of God then sent them into the desert and through the Red Sea. And who did that as well? God did that, bringing them to their salvation. So with that, Moses and Elijah are now moving towards, facing towards, facing towards the future. Speaking now of the accomplishments of Jesus that will come in Jerusalem. Where now Jesus is the perfect Lamb of God whose blood will be spilled and wiped on the doorposts of the cross. So when death comes to us, and it all will, it will come to all of us, it will literally pass over you. You are saved by trusting that blood on that cross and then taking us not through the Red Sea, but right through the bowels of hell itself to the other side, which we call the heaven, the kingdom of God, our salvation. How about that? For passionate love. Suffering, yes, because of passionate love. So, how are we to be shaped by that? It's quite easy. It's not brain surgery, praise God. Jesus says, watch me. Follow me. I'll demonstrate. I will disciple you so you can disciple somebody else. And so the simple little illustration I'm going to be using now comes from a ministry called 3DM. Not 3M, 3DM, three-dimensional ministry. Three ways that we can experience the relationship with the Father through Jesus. It goes like this, up and then in and then out. Up, in, and out. And Susan's going to help us. You know what we're doing here, friends? I just want a, a, a visual to be caught in your face. Caught in your face. So your face begins to face this and begin to face outward. Here's what Jesus says in John 5 and 19. I tell you, the son can do nothing on his own. Any more than you can do anything on your own. But only what he sees the father doing. So what Jesus is saying is, I'm being modeled by God what to do. I'm being directed by God what to do. Because I'm going up to God. I'm leaning in, into his face. His face becomes my face. For whatever the Father does, the Son is going to do likewise. So we begin with up. Looking up. 
Now, this pastor is guilty a lot of the times of getting up in the morning, and the first thing I do is not looking up to God. I look at my schedule, how busy it is, and how I have to get after things to get everything done. And what do I do? I get things done in my own power, but there's something always missing. Oh, I know what it is. The power of God. I missed out on the power of God for my day. There's a calling here to look up, first and foremost. It's like the great commandment. God says, I want you to love the Lord your God, me, with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your mind. Let's go face to face. Here with that in mind, let's, let's take some look at some Luke, Luke examples of looking up and the power and the possibilities that come when we do so by how Jesus models this for us. There's Luke 5, 12, and 13. A man with leprosy is begging Jesus to be healed. And the man says to Jesus, if you choose, I know you can make me clean. And what does Jesus say? Mm, mm, mm. No, he doesn't. He says, I choose. Immediately, he says, I choose. Because anyone who calls out to God will be heard. That's the model that we're getting here. That God desires healing and he desires restoration. Now, how is it Jesus able to do that? Remember, we just heard him say he can't do it on his own. But only what the Father models for him. So he first turns up to God. Next verse, Luke 5, 20, 21. This happens right afterwards. You recall the story of, of uh, Jesus healing inside of Simon Peter's home? There's so many people there trying to get a glimpse of Jesus or get healed that it's packed. So there's a paralytic and his four buddies say, we're going to go to the top of the roof, lower him down through the ceiling, and put him right in front of Jesus' face because they wanted Jesus to heal him. And Jesus says, mm, mm, mm. no, he says, I can do that. And he declares, your sins are forgiven. That's a healing of a crippled up soul. The religious leaders, they, they just don't get it at all. They're like, blasphemy! Only God can forgive sin. So then the story continues on, 523. Jesus then says, okay, to show you that I've gone to face to face with God today. I have the authority from the Father because I looked up. To say, to declare, your crippling sin is forgiven. But as a little sideshow, stand up, walk. You've been healed twice in just the last moment. Modeling for us how God has a heart and a desire for restoration, healing, and future. Of our minds, of our bodies, and our souls. And all because Jesus had turned up looking into the face of God for such a possibility. But wait, there's more. Luke 5, 31. Right after this, again, the religious leaders who are always angry, people who are law-driven are always angry. Have you noticed that? They are upset that Jesus is now eating with sinners. And Jesus says, well, wait a minute. Those who are well have no need of a physician, only those who are sick. Jesus is mulling God's face for the sick and the outcast. So here we have miracles, we have ministry, and we have breakthroughs. Kind of like Asbury University. All begin, all start, all are ignited by first looking up to God. For God's power, for God's direction. How about this? Hey, Father, what do you think today? We often start today by, this is what I think. Who cares what you think? Go to God. Let his thoughts become your thoughts you'll find you're way more effective, way more effective. In other words, friends, before you do anything, start by first engaging God. How about doing this, looking up in prayer? It shapes you, and it'll shape the rest of your day. And so from that first starting point of up, Jesus now leads us to in, in. Jesus demonstrates and models his relationship with his in group, his 12 disciples, right? That could be your small group that you might have. These are people that you have influence with and over. And of that 12, as we were talking today by going up the mountain, Jesus is really drilling into three, Peter, James, and John. So again, who are your three that you say, I really want to pour into? Because Jesus is modeling for us, mm -hmm, modeling for us the best way to make disciples. And it's not by doing what I'm doing right now, 
by proclaiming the gospel, as important as this is, yes. But disciples are oftentimes made in those intimate, quiet moments, either planned, sometimes not even planned, where people begin to simply engage each other through relationships. It could be your spouse. It could be your children, grandchildren, friends, neighbors, co-workers. It's the Great Commission, if you will. The Great Commission is go and make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. As you go on your way, be shaped by me, says Jesus, so you can have an impact in your influence group. Because shaping people like Jesus happens when you yourself have been shaped by Jesus. It's kind of like this, friends. Way back in the day, when I ran high school track, my forte was the 800 meters. That's twice around the track, about a half a mile. And when that gun went off, set, go! I went, I mean, boom! Round the track two times as hard and as fast as I could. And I hit that tape and I was done, spent. My legs were so, so tired from all the effort that I put into it that I could hardly walk for about an hour. That's really good in track. However, Jesus models the opposite for us. He says, I want to shape you with a steady pace of grace. Every day, not once in a while, every day looking up so you have something for the in. Because discipleship is way more than just a download of good information. It's about surrendering and allowing God to embed himself into your daily patterns of life. I'll give you an example. We all know John 3.16, do we not? Really the cornerstone of the gospel, John 3.16. In fact, we know it so well, you, you, right now you can do it by heart. So let's try that. John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that whoever believeth upon him would not perish, but have eternal life. Very good. That's, it's embedded into you. You know that. John 3.16. Well, how about this? John 3.22. Anyone want to? John 3.22. It's just a couple of verses down from 3.16. Seemingly insignificant, but I think it's hugely important. It goes like this. After, Jesus, after this, Jesus took his, his disciples, his 12, his in-group, the guys that he was speaking into, they go into the Judean countryside, and there he spent some time with them. That simple phrase, spent some time with them, in the Greek, which of course is the original language of the New Testament, the word for that is diatribo. Diatribo. Let's say that out loud together. One, two, three. Diatribo. One more time, nice and loud. Diatribo. Very good. You can almost hear the root of that. Die. Give away. Jesus is dying to himself. He's giving himself into others. He's shaping others like he is shaped. But the real definition of diatribo is this. To rub off against. To rub off against. To rub off against someone, you have to be close enough somehow, either physically or, or relationally, to be able to speak into somebody. And so having an up relationship with God, where God diatribos you, speaks into you, now gives you something that you now have so you can rub into somebody else. You can diatribal into somebody else. That's how the in works. So we go from up in a Jesus-shaped life to an in in a Jesus-shaped life. And now Jesus gets us ready to go out. To go out. This is where we often get hung up. This is where we often stop. And when we stop, the mission stops. Like the Lombardi Trophy goes up. Hey, we're done for the season. We don't have to play for another three, four months. No. When the multiplication stops, the impact of Jesus stops. And that's exactly what Satan wants. So I say, stop helping him out, church. He could care less if you come inside our church building on a Sunday, worship him, or open up the Bible, study him, or serve him inside the church. He just does not want you to go out and into the community. Think about this. For decades now, decades, we Christians have gone into our church buildings where we enjoy our fellowship, where we enjoy our Bible studies, where we enjoy our worship. Meanwhile, what is the devil doing? 
He's not being held back inside a building. He's going out into the culture, going into people's lives and then taking it into government agencies, into schools, into the entertainment and the arts, the movie theaters. Why? To expand his influence. But Jesus, but Jesus is demonstrating to us his way. His ways, I want you to go out and participate in the salvation of all things in this broken world. Luke, Luke chapter 19, the Zacchaeus story. You know this as Zacchaeus was uh, a Jewish man, but he was working for the Roman government as a tax collector. Therefore, he's hated by his fellow Jews. He's feeling separated, isolated. A rich man, but what good does that do, he thinks. So he climbs up a sycamore tree one day because he hears that Jesus is going to be walking by. He wants to see the face of God. He's looking for something. He may not know what, though. And Jesus turns and faces Zacchaeus, calls him down and says, I'm going to your house today. Jesus then says this, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. But a better translation than that, my friends, a truer translation is this. The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. So Jesus went and Zacchaeus' family came to salvation that day. And his co-workers and his business folks came to worship or came to salvation that day. And then as a response to that, they go back out into the community and they begin to invest their money that they had stolen back into ministries. How about that? For transformation. Because yes, people, Jesus came to save people, but he also came to save places and things. Governments, schools, hospitals, the arts, the entertainment, I've been saying it over and over. I want you to grab onto this because all things belong to God. All things belong to God. Therefore, all things are called to give God the glory. When we don't, it's sin. Now, as disciples of Jesus, we are being equipped up and in and then empowered to go out and alter the world with our faces. Alter the world as the face of Christ. Because when we do exercise, hear that? Exercise up and in and out. In Jesus' three-dimensional kingdom, our capacity for living the life that we were designed by God to live dramatically increases. Don't believe me? Try it. Here's an example right now, an easy example. What I love about Pastor John is he's real quick to say, hey, how is your spirit doing today? How's your spirit doing today? We could respond by saying, oh, I'm really tired. I'm crazy busy. That's, that's the way the world talks, friends. Catch yourself saying that. Instead, how about you surprise dear Pastor John by talking about your in, or excuse me, how about your up with God? How's that going? If it's not going so well, that's okay. Because you can come back. You can come back to God. How's your in doing? How's your out? That'll impact your spirit. Friends, we practice that as a church. And we will be a new fighting force that darkness has no idea how to deal with. I say that's the outcome of Lent, don't you? So with that in mind, here now is your homework. First and foremost, come to Ash Wednesday worship service. It is the igniter of Ash I was created from the, from the dirt, and to the dirt I shall return. It reminds me that I'm not the creator, God is. I get to be the created. And then, I'm inviting you to dedicate yourself and your families to come to worship here at the church every Wednesday night for the 40 days of the Lenten season. We even have soup to take care of that supper excuse that sometimes we have. Because as you do, this is what we're going to be doing every Wednesday, talking about your up, talking about your in, and talking about your out. We're going to practice it. We're going to hear, we're going to hear testimonies. We're going to have bantering back and forth. It's going to be very different, very fun. It's all about being shaped to having a life that looks a lot like Jesus. And so, friends, here's the invitation and the bottom line. From right now on, make this the greatest, most crucial, most impacting, Asbury University, Holy Spirit ignited, Lenten season, this church has ever known. And let's see what happens next. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. All right. Ushers, you can receive our gracious offerings.